Okay guys, we're going to go ahead and start talking about covalent bonding. And this is uh, section 6.2 in your books. Now, first we have to figure out how does a covalent bond form, what we're looking for. Now in the introduction to chemical bonding, we said that a covalent bond is a non-metal, non-metal bond. So if we look here, we're going to use the example of hydrogen. Okay, and hydrogen bonding to another hydrogen. Okay, this is one of our diatomic um, elements. And we see that as hydrogen and hydrogen, on this graph, we see that over here we have energy, and over here we're going to have our distance. So basically what we're saying, and we're looking at the graph going this way, we're saying that as the hydrogens get closer together, we see that energy decreases. Okay. Specifically, this would be our potential energy decreases. It's giving off energy. So as they get closer together, they give off uh, that potential energy. And what happens is they reach a point where they have uh, given off all the potential energy they have. And they bond to each other. And they bond at this distance, which is 0 0.074 nanometers. And what we see is that if we keep going and pushing them closer together it increases the energy okay which we know that everything wants to become stable everything wants to become and go to the lowest energy possible okay so what we see is that there is an attraction between the electrons and what what is pulling the atoms together what's pulling the two hydrogens together are the attraction between the electrons and pulling in from the clouds. And then we see we have a repulsion or uh, a repulsive force from the nucleus. So electrons are pulling it in, the nucleus is pushing out, and basically what happens is we reach a balance. A balance between the attraction and the repulsion of the particles. And this distance at which they our balance, meaning they equal, that's the bond length, and that's when we have formed a covalent bond. Now, we see a distance between the nucleus is reached when the repulsion and attraction forces are equal. Potential energy is at its lowest possible point. We talked about that on the graph, and it's at the bottom of that curve on the potential energy graph, and that is when a covalent bond is formed. Now, what happens is that energy that is given off, that potential energy that is converted into energy that is given off, uh, when those atoms form bonds, they become more stable and they release that energy. Now, the law of conservation of energy says that the energy that is given off is not wasted, that, that it's not destroyed. But what we see that the amount of energy that is given off must be absorbed by that bond or by that molecule to break that bond. So the energy given off is the same energy that it takes to break it. So we see that the higher the bond energy, meaning the higher the energy is that is released in the creation of the bond, the stronger that bond is. And we can look at examples looking at a carbon-carbon single bond. We see that bond length is 154 picometers and we see that the bond energy is 347 kilojoules per mole. In a double bond, we see that we have a bond length of 134 picometers and a bond energy of 614 kilojoules per mole. And then in a triple bond, carbon-carbon triple bond, we see that the bond length is 120 picometers and the bond energy is 839 kilojoules per mole. Now the trend that we should see here first as bond, enter, or bond length goes down, meaning we're decreasing the distance between the two atoms, bond energy is going up. Okay, we see that a single bond has 347, and then when we go to a triple, it's 839. So we see that there's an inverse proportionality between bond length and bond energy, meaning as one goes up, the other goes down. We decrease bond length, so bond energy goes up. And we also see that a triple bond, if it has a bond energy of 839, 
it'll take the same 839 kilojoules to break it. So we know that a triple bond is the strongest of the three bonds, and a single bond would be the weakest. Now, when we have covalent bonds, they all form to the fact of they want to make, uh, they want to become like a noble gas. And this is what we call the octet rule. Okay, it's the ultimate goal of an atom in a compound to look like a noble gas, to have eight valence electrons. So the octet rule says that every atom must have eight valence electrons. Now they do this by they will either gain, lose, or share electrons so that they have eight electrons in the outer energy level, eight valence electrons. So in covalent bonding, we know that they share electrons. So when covalent bonds are formed, they have to form in, in a way that each element has eight valence electrons. Is sharing atoms to have eight. Now, we do have some exceptions to that rule. The main rule that we should be, or the main exception that we should worry about is hydrogen. Hydrogen is happy with two electrons, meaning it's called the duet rule. It only needs two. Okay, that's the main one that we need to focus on. We see that there are some exceptions, like boron can be happy with six electrons, or sulfur and phosphorus can actually have more than eight electrons. We see that here. But we're mainly going to focus on hydrogens happy with a two, the duet rule. Now, electron dot diagrams, what we use these for in covalent bonding and in ionic bonding, it shows the number of valence electrons on the S and P Bach elements. Okay, we draw the dots around the element symbol to match the number of valence electrons. So we find the number of valence electrons and we put a dot. One dot, or one valence electron equals one dot. Two valence electrons, two, three, three, and four, four. Now when you're drawing these, just start on one side and go around clockwise and add. Now the most that you can have for electron dot diagrams, you can only have eight dots because the maximum number of valence electrons is eight. Now we use the electron dot diagrams uh, to help us show Lewis structures, which Lewis structures is electron dot diagram for compounds. Okay, The dots show um, unshared electrons and the dashes, meaning the bonds between atoms, uh, show the shared electrons in covalent bonds. Okay, and the structural formula is the same as loose structures, just without the dots. Okay, so we'll look at an example of how we draw a Lewis structure, and then we'll look at the structural formula. Now, first we have to determine the type and number of atoms in a molecule. And we write down the electron dot notation for each atom. We add up the total number of valence electrons, and then we arrange the atoms with carbon in the center. If carbons, we don't have carbon, use the least electronegative element. And remember to never use hydrogen as a central atom because it follows the duet rule. It only needs two. Then we connect the shared electrons with dashes, meaning we show the bonds. And then we double check ourselves by counting all the electrons to see if they match. We add the extra electrons around the side. So let's work an example. So we're going to draw the Lewis structure for CH3Cl, which is methyl chloride. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to recognize what's involved. We have carbon, hydrogen, and chlorine. Then we write down how many of each we have. We have one carbon, three hydrogens, and one chlorine. Then we look on the periodic table and figure out how many valence electrons they have. Carbon has four. Hydrogen has one, and chlorine has seven, which gives us a total number of valence electrons of 14. Then we set it up with carbon in the middle. So we draw carbon, and then we put our hydrogens around it because we have three of them. And we have one chlorine, so we put it to the side. Now we make a bond. We bond here, bond here, bond here, bond here. Okay? And we know that each line represents two, or two shared electrons, so we just drew it for eight. So 14 minus eight gives us six. Now we have six left, 
And we know the duet rule tells us is hydrogen's happy with two. So it already has two and it can't take any more electrons. So we start with the outside and we start with chlorine and we add six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and we're out and we're down to zero. Now we check and make sure, does everybody have eight? Well, hydrogens only need two because it's an exception. So that's happy, that's happy, and that's happy. We see that chlorine has eight because it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight with the dashes. And then we see that chlorine's happy because it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Looking all nice and neat, what it'll look like is this. We have our bonds we created. Then we added six to chlorine. And we see hydrogen follows the duet. And it's happy with what it has. And carbon and chlorine have the octet. And they're happy with what they have. So everybody has either an octet or a duet. And it's done. Now, there's a few different types of covalent bonds. And what we see is that when we have a single bond, we see that two of the electrons are shared. And this is the weakest and the longest of the covalent bonds. Then we have what we have double bonds, which means we have four shared electrons. And we see that that's stronger and shorter than the single bond, but it's not the strongest. Triple, where we share six electrons, is the strongest and the shortest of the three types of bonds. And then lastly, we have what we call resonant structures, where sometimes molecules and compounds can make up their own minds on how they want to be, how they want to look, okay? Meaning one Lewis structure is just not enough. Uh, in these situations, two plus Lewis structures are drawn, and the molecules actually is an average of all of them. So they get, they get to show what they want to be.